Rolf. Good afternoon. It's Friday, the 7th of June, 2019, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. And we're going to start, Brian, with uh, with press freedom and the uh, the raids by police in Australia on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, so police uh, apparently arrived with search warrants. Uh, the search warrants named two reporters and the news director. Uh, and this was apparently related to uh, alleged misconduct uh, by the uh, Australian military while they were in Afghanistan. So uh, ABC had pushed out a, an investigative series known as the Afghan Files uh, in 2017. Uh, and uh, they say that these revealed allegations of unlawful killings and misconduct by the Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan. And they said it was based off hundreds of pages of secret defence documents leaked to ABC. Um, so here's uh, a couple of images of the warrant. Uh, and uh, well, one of the, I think the head of news at ABC was, uh, was tweeting this out live on Wednesday when it was taking place. Uh, the uh, Australian Federal Police have said that uh, this warrant has been issued in relation to allegations of publishing classified material. Uh, and it relates to a referral received on the 11th of July 2017 from the Chief of the Defence Force and the then Acting Secretary of Defence. But it wasn't the only uh, search going on uh, the day before, the previous day. Uh, the Sunday Telegraph in Australia, journalist Annika Smethurst had been, uh, her home had been raided. Uh, and this was apparently related to uh, unrelated to the ABC events, but related to a 2018 report that she published about uh, government plans to spy on the Australian public. Um, so the police said that uh, the raids were not connected on Tuesday and Wednesday, but both relate to separate allegations of publishing classified material, contrary to the provisions of the Crimes Act 1914, uh, which is an extremely serious matter that has the potential to undermine Australia's national security. Uh, and the police defended their actions. They said that uh, they had been independent and impartial at all times. Uh, so no, no doubt that feels, fills you with confidence. Uh, not at all, Mike. No. Not at all. Um, but I'll add to that that uh, I think what we've got here is a big wake-up call to journalists working for the mainstream media, wherever they be, BBC or elsewhere, because at the moment they do not see this beast which is closing in around them. So time they woke up really. Well, indeed, absolutely. We'll, we'll get there in a second. This is uh, the, another comment from the, the acting commissioner of the Australia Federal, Australian Federal Police, uh, Neil Gochen. Uh, the investigation is complex, he said, it's ongoing. Potentially, yes, we may do more searches. So uh, they're saying it's not over. Now the BBC, ironically enough, have pushed out a statement on uh, on this, they said the police raid against our partners at ABC is an attack on press freedom, which we at the BBC find deeply troubling. At a time when the media is becoming less free across the world, it's highly worrying if a public broadcaster is being targeted for doing its job uh, of reporting in the public interest. Well, look, uh, the thing here is, in my opinion, Brian, this is one of the reasons why the Julian Assange case is so important. It's interesting that the BBC absolutely silent on this. They're not supporting him in any way, shape or form. But what I, when I look around uh, uh, the internet, I see lots of people not supporting Julian Assange because they don't like Assange personally. Uh, but there's a bigger issue here. If we agree that Assange was a publisher uh, and he was publishing leaked information, leaked documents, uh, there's nothing against the law. Uh, it's, not, it's not against the law to publish leaked documents. Uh, the ABC have been writing stories, producing documentaries yeah. based on leaked documents. Um, so there's an issue here now in the United States, uh, as Bill Binney said to me uh, when we did the interview last week, um, which you can find on the UK Column YouTube channel. In the United States, the government can't maintain a classification on a document. Uh, where it shows evidence, where the document shows evidence of a criminal offence. Now, I'm not certain that that is uh, actually uh, a, a hard rule in the UK or in, in Australia, but uh, it seems that that should be the principle. Well, 
applying common sense certainly might because otherwise um, you've got license just to cover up crimes now we we know that the uk government is happy to cover up cr crimes let's come back to re rendition flights is it conceivable that rendition flights were organized without evidence of those flights sorry well, let's qualify that rendition for torture flights um, is it possible those flights were organized without evidence of such on documents and i would say the answer to that is absolutely not so what this uh, gentleman is saying makes complete sense and should be operating i would say in any any country so anyway to get back to assange for a second i think if we've got if people have personal problems with with assange as a as an individual uh, we need to be looking at the bigger picture here because what the abc uh, incident and also the uh, Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph journalist in Australia, what that shows is this, it, this is not a problem in the United States or in the UK. This is a problem globally, uh, certainly in the Western world, uh, that governments are starting to crack down on free speech, not just with the alternative media, but the mainstream media as well. Now, there are many, many reasons why we should be criticizing the mainstream media when they're not doing their jobs. But nonetheless, <clears throat> when, when there's an attack like this, uh, on freedom of the press everybody should be uh, campaigning against that in my yeah. opinion and presumably the BBC has re reacted because it's ABC so yes. they yes. see this as one of their brothers that's right um, if it was a lesser media outfit I, I could imagine that the BBC would have been a lot more squeamish mm. but um, if you're out there and you're a BBC journalist it's time to wake up to what's really happening well, let's go to the other end of the scale. Um, this is ordinary members of the public speaking out about what's happening. And we've been reporting on this lady, Georgia Pulika, who has put up a large number of videos warning about what's been happening to the yellow vests in France and the just unbelievable brutality of the French police with people losing eyes and hands and other and sustaining other major injuries. So the UK column has helped uh, Georgia to put out her story and the interview there, or the image is uh, taken from our, our interview with Georgia. We're pleased to say that uh, she's now put up the fully French subtitled version of that. That's on Georgia's own channel, which is Switch uh, News TV. And um, if you're one of our viewers or listeners in France, and we know there's quite a few of you um, perhaps you'd have a look at that um, subtitled report and help us to um, distribute it. Now, why are matters in France important? And let's uh, just remember what you've been talking about, gagging the media. This is something very, very interesting here, sent through to us this morning. Uh, so initially taken from a lady's um, Twitter page, Angela Walsh, fascinating new law from France, banning publication of statistical analyses of judges decisions seems like an attempt to maintain mystique legitimacy of legal system as above the flaws of particular humans well we were able to do a little bit of work on this before coming live and um, this um, particular publication artificial lawyer has got a very good article so here we are france bans judge analytics five years in prison for rule breakers and i read this mike and i thought how interesting that we've got this coming out in france as um, the public in france are getting more and more concerned about decisions about yellow vests is, but this, it, is this some issue of national security um, no it just appears to be that the um, french judiciary don't want um, analytics showing what sort of decisions they make compared to you know what case they're examining uh, but when I read this what came into my head and north of the border in Scotland we've got the business that the judges don't want their uh, interests made public so the public can be sure there's no conflict of interest the judges are secretive I think this is the start of circling of the wagons because people are now really getting interested in who the judges are and uh, the decisions they're making uh, this is a little bit from the article it says in a startling intervention that seeks to limit the emerging litigation analytics and prediction sector the french government has banned the publication of statistical information about judges decisions with a five-year prison sentence set as the maximum punishment for anyone who breaks the new law and uh, it goes on the new law encoded in article 33 of the justice reform act is aimed at preventing anyone 
but especially legal tech companies focused on litigation prediction and analytics from publicly revealing the pattern of judges behavior in relation to court decisions a key passage of the new law states the identity data of magistrates and members of the judiciary cannot be reused with the purpose or effect of evaluating analyzing comparing or predicting their actual or alleged professional practices so if we've got a biased judge we certainly don't want any form of analytics uh, pointing that out to the public and uh, if you try and do that you're going to get five years in prison but don't worry that uh, France under President Macron is allegedly still a dict <laughs> still a democracy nearly used the wrong word there democracy under the European Union super state um, last night uh, Ian Crane was in the studio uh, and John Smith from the common law court was his guest uh, I'd recommend people uh, watch that discussion uh, humanity versus insanity episode 117 you can see that on Ian R Crane's YouTube channel um, and one of the things that John Smith was discussing was uh, the extradition of Lynn Thayer to France uh, because the common law court has stepped in to assist with that uh, and uh, he the, paperwork has gone into initially to the high court but now to the supreme court uh, to try and prevent uh, this extradition of Lynn Thayer of course one of the people involved uh, with uh, GC MAF uh, and, uh, and and cancer uh, helping people with cancer through GC MAF but anyway she's due to be extradited to France and she was due to be picked up uh, in the next day or two but uh, it seems that following the paperwork going into the supreme court uh, because there's an ongoing judicial process it seems uh, that uh, that extradition has now been uh, delayed uh, and she's uh, received notification that uh, that they will not be arriving on, a, on her doorstep in the immediate future so we'll keep you posted on how this uh, proceeds and a very interesting exercise Mike because uh, the minimum we can say from this is that uh, the courts have not been able to dismiss these common law court findings out of hand they've had to react and that reaction has been a significant delay in the process as a minimum so we can see here that where common law is being brought to the fore um, the so-called judicial system in this country is having problems with it and why is that because of course common law has been suppressed but uh, more on this in due course let's have a look at uh, this report with the guardian uh, considering what we've just been discussing about common law ex-soldier denied jury trial over Northern Ireland killing Dennis Hutchins faces trial in a Diplock court for alleged attempted murder during the troubles and the um, text here said that um, uh, he was a member of the lifeguards regiment he shot a man running away who failed to stop um, but unfortunately the man running away had learning difficulties and was very frightened of uh, of men in uniform so this is a particularly sad uh, case uh, but Hutchins had sought trial before a jury rather than a Diplock court where the judge decides the case in order to avoid the danger of jury intimidation in terrorist terrorist related cases now I think there's a huge amount of questions to be asked around what's going on here but let's have a look at what the uh, the judge had to say uh, sorry the Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland had to say that's uh, uh, Brian Kerr he said trial by jury can in certain circumstances be antithetical to a fair trial and the only assured means where those circumstances of, sorry and the only assured means where those circumstances obtained of ensuring that the trial is fair is that it be conducted by a judge sitting without a jury uh, there was no fundamental right to have a trial by jury the fundamental right is to a fair trial uh, I think I think that's not quite correct uh, well exactly Mike because of course what this brings in in uh, to the fore is common law the uh, foundation of the law system in this country uh, which says that you are entitled to trial by jury so there's a number of questions being raised in this case but here we see the judges apparently just changing constitutional law uh, as they see fit although to be fair to um, uh, Mr Kerr let's have a look at the, the um, wiki report on Diplock courts I just chose this source to be uh, 
uh, quick for the news, but basically it says Diplock courts were criminal courts in Northern Ireland for non-jury trial of specified serious crimes. They were introduced by the Northern Ireland Emergency Provisions Act 1973, used for political and terrorism related cases and abolished by the Justice and Security Northern Ireland Act 2007. And if that is correct, we've got another question here that the Diplock courts were abolished and yet the papers are reporting this man is to be put through a Diplock court. Well, the next sentence says non-jury trial remains possible on a case-by-case -case certification rather than automatically applying. But, uh, you know, it, the, the Diplock courts were put, the justification for it, the justification of removing the right to a jury trial was put uh, into Northern Ireland at the height of the troubles yeah. uh, when there was... Uh, intimidation in juries yeah. but if you're concerned about that there are other jurisdictions in the uk that you could hold the trial it doesn't have to be held in northern ireland yeah it could be held somewhere else uh, and uh, but the bottom line here is this is uh, a, a british uh, subject uh, a member of the armed forces that that should be entitled to a jury trial should be entitled to a jury trial um, but um, it would appear the judges and the league and the political system in uk at the moment, I'm just prepared to uh, change constitutional law at the drop of a hat. Mm. Uh, we're going to be looking more at common law in the, in the coming weeks. But if you're not familiar with it, please do your own research and ask the question, why is the uh, judicial system so scared to talk about common law? Um, OK, if you quick reminder, if you like what we're doing, uh, please uh, head over to ukcolumn.org slash community where you can uh, join as a member and support us there. Uh, and you can also, uh, if you would like to support us, Andy and our crane, uh, head over to the uh, UK Column shop and get hold of some AV10 DVDs. Absolutely worth the effort. Absolutely. Mm. Now, uh, let's move on to, to this uh, Aegis upgrade in Romania. Now, uh, NATO, uh, of course, installed the Aegis Ashore ballistic missile defence system uh, in Romania in 2016. Uh, and, uh, well, it's due already for uh, a long planned upgrade, they say. Uh, this update, as they say, which has been taking place across the uh, system fleet, the Aegis system fleet, will not provide any offensive capability to the Aegis Ashore military defence system. So note that it will not provide any offensive uh, capability apparently but anyway uh, they were very pleased they sorry they were very pleased uh, to announce that uh, but while this upgrade is going on the Aegis uh, shore ballistic missile defense system will have to come offline uh, and so they have temporarily deployed uh, a thermal uh, sorry a terminal high altitude area defense a THAAD system uh, in the same location they're very excited about this so this uh, unit will be under NATO operational control and the full political control of the North Atlantic Council. It will only remain operational, they say, until the Aegis Ashore Romania site is back online. Uh, the update and deployment are expected to last several weeks. Uh, and uh, well, in accordance, uh, in accordance with NATO's ballistic missile defense system, um, it is purely defensive. Aegis Ashore Romania is purely a defensive system. They say that in a four paragraph press release, they say that at least twice. Uh, yep. They're very excited to make sure that we understand that it is purely a defensive system. And that is because it's not, is the simple explanation, because, of course, what, it, what you're doing is providing air, air and missile defence for whatever else you're doing on the ground. And what we're seeing going on on the ground is a reinforcement and forward deployment of uh, military assets. So the two go hand in hand. So um, it's a complete red herring to claim that this is a defensive system. Its object is to protect what you are building as an offensive system. Mm. Now, uh, a couple of days ago, we were talking about uh, the Turkey, that is the F-35, and the issues with respect to Turkey and the uh, Turkey wanting to purchase the S-400 missile defense system from Russia. Uh, well, the United States has decided that it will not be accepting any additional Turkish pilots to come to the United States for training on this aircraft. Uh, there, um, four Turkish pilots are currently training uh, at Luke Air Force Base. Two additional tur Turkish pilots are um, also there working as instructors. But beyond those six, uh, they are not gonna take any more. There are also 20 aircraft maintainers there, uh, but they, it doesn't look like they're gonna get any opportunity to maintain 
uh, any aircraft. Now, we highlighted what uh, Catherine Wheelbarger had to say on Monday's programme. Completion of this transaction would be devastating, not only for the F-35 programme. This is the transaction to buy the S-400s from Russia, uh, on which the West has placed its modernising integrated air capability, but it would potentially rupture Turkish interoperability with NATO. Well, she has also said the S-400 is a Russian system designed to shoot down an aircraft like the F-35, and it's inconceivable to imagine Russia not taking advantage of that intelligence collection opportunity. Um, so uh, that's it. Looks like uh, Turkey is going to be uh, dropped from this program. And, and I ask the question once again, where does this leave engine maintenance? Yeah, well, nobody wants to answer that question, no. Mike. But um, the whole thing is a shambles. But of course, it's it's been a well-engineered shambles because uh, the plan has been for many years to include Turkey in this program, mm -hmm. even though Turkey was not fully committed one way, whether it was to the European Union or to, to the Russian side. So nobody's asking the question, who created this absolute chaos in defence where we're supposed to have bought the F-35 to have it immaculately maintained in Turkey, uh, but now it's not going to happen. Uh, well, of course, uh, not all of it, just the engines. Just the engines. Just the engines. You've got to take the engines out and ship them to Turkey for maintenance and upgrades. It, right. It's a really clever system, isn't it? Uh, no. No. Uh, but it gets better. Uh, now, this is not a bad article in the uh, national interest here. Uh, its headline is, The Royal Navy has big aircraft carrier plans armed with F-35s, and they make a few useful points. They say that Penny Morden took over uh, as Defence Secretary after Theresa May fired uh, Gavin Williamson for allegedly leaking the Huawei, uh, the, the, the decision on Huawei, uh, which of course he didn't. Uh, and uh, they say that uh, when the Prince, well, they quote Penny Morden as saying that when the Prince of Wales joins Queen Elizabeth in the fleet in the near future, uh, we'll have one aircraft carrier available at very high readiness at all times. And this will match our strategic nuclear deterrent uh, with a conventional one. Uh, I want to make sure that we make the most of this incredible sovereign capability. Uh, but they make the point that uh, the most recent round of, round of uh, uh, defence cuts, which began in 2010, eliminated two aircraft carriers, two amphibious ships, four frigates, an army brigade, more than a third of the army's tanks and artillery, and all of the Air Force's Harrier jump jets uh, and maritime patrol aircraft. Uh, uniform manpower dropped by 30,000. Uh, and of course, uh, the Royal Navy uh, is now only 19 surface ships, including 13 frigates and six destroyers. And they don't have, and they make the point that we have made many times, we do not have the support vessels for the uh, carriers. Um, now, they're saying that British military spending has stabilized around $55 billion annually. Uh, and they say that, but even $55 billion a year might not be enough to maintain both carriers and their aircraft, plus a robust fleet of naval surface combatants that, amongst other missions, escort the carriers during wartime. But they don't ask the question how this untenable situation can uh, continue to be. They don't ask the question, why would Britain have two aircraft carriers, which they are arguing are going to cost to maintain our entire defence budget? And of course, so they don't mention uh, EU Defence Union uh, and, uh, and so on. Now, the key point is that the Royal Navy has big aircraft carrier plans, they say. And this is because on the 15th of May, Penny Mordaunt announced that the Ministry of Defence will develop a new national carrier policy. Uh, now, she was at, then asked about that by Nye Griffith, uh, and uh, the response that came back in a written parliamentary answer from Nye Griffith was, uh, and as I said in my speech on the 15th of May, the national carrier policy will lay the blueprint for how we propose to utilise our aircraft carriers to develop global Britain's activity, uh, sorry, objectives around the world. The policy is currently under development. And of course it's currently under development because right at the heart of that policy is going to be the fact that the carriers will be part of Defence Union at a EU level because they can't function any other way. Uh, and that cannot be made public at this point in time. Yeah, they're, they're in a complete mess over this. To say that you built these two and you, um, two aircraft carriers at billions of pound cost, but you didn't know what you were gonna use them for, now we've built them, we're actually gonna sit down and think what we can do with them. This is, this is where the British government is at the moment under the Conservatives. 
and uh, the national carrier policy. It sounds a little bit like um, one of one of the um, delivery van mm. services, doesn't it? So we've got these big aircraft carriers. We're going to use them to project British global power. That's what they said. But unfortunately, at the moment, we're not sure how we're going to do that. And we're going to have a think. Yes. We'll, Speechless. We'll, a lot of people say we're too serious, so we're going to start laughing because we don't know how to report this anymore. It is so bizarre. It is so full of cartoonness that it's getting very difficult to report the news. What should people be doing? They should be pinning their politicians down on a minute by minute basis to challenge them over what must be a vast waste of money while we can't support old elderly people or the NHS. Mm. But we'll smile. Uh, well, of course, the military can't run carriers at the moment, uh, but they can uh, watch what uh, uh, is happening on social media. I'd just like to say that somebody sent us in this little one, which I thought was really excellent. So a gentleman, Peter de Gourley, said, do you mean to use the official at Gowerton Primary School account to tweet this hatred or did you think you were on your personal account? It's frightening that such people have influence over our children during their formative years. And here's the tweet, and it, indeed it has come on the uh, Gowton Primary, which is a South Wales primary school account. And the person has said, I don't normally comment on Twitter, but watching Piers Morgan on Question Time, what an obnoxious, ignorant, fascist pig. Why do we give people like him airtime? Now, we took the trouble to speak to um, Swansea City Council, uh, they said they were prepare, uh, preparing a press statement and we noted that uh, at that time the Gowerton primary Twitter account had been taken down. Uh, we did get a, um, a statement uh, which I shall have to try very hard to read. It says, hi Brian, I believe you spoke with my colleague Andy and requested the following statement. A spokesperson for Gowerton School said we would like to sincerely apologise for the tweet a member of staff believed they were tweeting in a personal capacity from their personal account, but inadvertently made uh, the post using the school account. As soon as the error was spotted, the tweet was removed. We're learning the lessons of this incident to ensure that it doesn't happen again. I agree with the person who picked up on this tweet in the first place, because um, what they're saying is it shows the kind of people that are teaching the children. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I did find it an, uh, amusing that an anonymous person was apologising for another anonymous person who yes. committed the crime. So perhaps we should keep the whole thing anonymous. And uh, where does that take us? Well, this one. And again, thank you very much for uh, the person who pointed this out. Uh, this is a web, uh, website which has this amazing story. UK University to monitor social media accounts to identify suicidal students and it's by a gentleman called David McCourt. Northumbria University in the northeast of England is set to take the radical step of using data collected from student social media accounts in a bid to reduce climbing student suicide rates. The higher educational institution located in Newcastle upon Time will create an early alert tool to offer aid to undergrads in crisis. Uh, this was a bit more of it. So the university is working in partnership with nine other organisations on the project and they've been awarded funding by the Office for Students. A total of 14.5 million has been put aside by OF, OFS, 6 million of which will go to the social media scanning project and another 8.5 million going to nine other collaborative projects. Now I find this quite extraordinary that these sums of money are being put into uh, watching students' social media. Uh, this is another paragraph. Few details were given about what information exactly would be mined from students' social media accounts. The project will raise concerns about the invasion of privacy, but these issues could be eased somewhat by an opt-in policy that requires students to consent to being part of the programme. Now, we spoke to the Office for Students and said, well, are students going to be able to opt in or opt out? And they said to us that, uh, well, they don't know at the moment because the project hasn't really been formulated. So we've given money for a project which the, uh, the donor of that public money doesn't even know what these key details are about. So they're going to hoover up all this data. Now, of course, Twitter, Facebook and so on, uh, they provide 
APIs to do that. So that that's if you take part in those uh, those platforms, it's yeah. anybody can hoover up your data. But the question here for me is, uh, is this going to end at identifying people that are at risk of suicide, or perhaps would the universities be looking at uh, other, uh, you know, at forms of thought crime? Uh, well, is this just going to be one arm of the prevent strategy and project channel so that if you dare express anything the state it believes is right wing extremist, you're going to be reported through to the prevent system. But let's have a look at uh, what the chief executive said. This is Nicola Danbridge. And she said, wherever, whenever I talk to students, improving mental health support is consistently raised as a priority. Taking preventative action to promote good mental health is critical, as is taking a whole institution approach and involves students in developing solutions. So apparently we're at the stage where students are not thinking about their education and how good that education is. They're preoccupied with their mental health. If that's true, we're in a pretty serious position. I'm not sure what the truth is. Uh, but uh, we just followed this through a bit. Here's the office for students. Uh, they're independent, Mike, Good. as always. Um, they were appointed by central government and they're connected uh, through to central government, but they are independent. And um, we've got some interesting people here. Here's Sir Michael Barber, the chair. Um, and um, he started out as chief advisor to the Secretary of State for Education from 1997 and he was a part of the Prime Minister's delivery unit. So very much an establishment man, but everything is independent of government here. And he did a little bit of work with um, consultancy McKinsey, who of course uh, ha has done a lot of work in uh, most governments. We've got uh, Gurpreet Dahal. Uh, he's a trustee of the Multi-School Academy Trust, E-Act. He also holds non-executive positions with the Ministry of Defence and Equity UK. Good. So, so, but but the, being non-executive, of course, he's, he's totally independent. He's totally independent. Um, and we've got Martin Coleman, Deputy Chair of the Board and chairs the Provider Risk Committee. And uh, I found this interesting that he's a trustee of an organisation called Police Now. Mm. I had no idea what that was. So we followed through. Here it is. Join us. Change the story. And uh, Police now is on a mission to, quote, transform communities, reduce crime and increase the public's confidence in policing by recruiting and developing outstanding and diverse individuals to be leaders in society uh, and on the policing front line. So you're not a policeman anymore. You're going to be changing the whole of society. So this is common purpose for police? It's common purpose for police, I would say so. And we've got some interesting people here. So we've got David Spencer, the co-founder and, and chief executive officer. Uh, he was an officer in the Met Police, so I suppose that makes sense. But he's done a lot of political degrees. If you have a look at the bottom, University of Sheffield, a master in US politics. And he's now doing a master, a research master's in politics from the University of London. Um, we've got another police constable there, Tor Garnet. And uh, this is where it gets interesting. The chairman of the board of trustees, um, uh, he spent the time as a, a chairman of and senior, sorry, <laughs> I'm running out of eyesight here. Let me just call this up on the other screen. Bear with me. Uh, age creeping in, I have to say. Uh, where are we? Let's get this gentleman up. Here we are. So um, Sir Ian Powell, we've got uh, left Price Waterhouse Coopers on the 13th, 30th of June 2016 uh, on completion of his second and final four year term as chairman and senior partner. Price Waterhouse, of course, very interesting company with lots of very big government contracts. Uh, but he then joined the board of Capita PLC uh, on the 1st of September as chairman designate. Um, so he's chairman of police now and a member of the committee for the national um, gallery so interesting connections and uh, the other gentleman there james darley uh, well he's been working in graduate recruitment and uh, he's got a background in credit swiss bank uh, and um, it's just interesting to say how does this relationship work is where we're really coming to and i can't explain it no 
um, we could go on a little bit more we just do these director general um, for tax and welfare at hm treasury james bowler so he according to this report is the director general for tax and welfare at hm treasury but he's helping police now transform society yes good stuff we'll leave it there yeah i mean what can what can we say about this mm, not a lot well look uh really good news brian really good news because uh, dame sally davies uh the chief medical officer uh is being replaced well she's retiring uh, now she came to fame for most people uh, following her advice uh, over the uh, Novichok poisoning and the Skripal affair, my advice for any individual, wash your clothes and wipe down any personal items, shoes and bags with cleansing or baby wipes before disposing of them in the usual way. So baby wipes solve Novichok. I'm glad to know that, uh, or to remind everybody of that. Well, she is being replaced, as I say, uh, with this gentleman. Uh, this is Chris Whitty. He becomes the new chief medical officer in a few months time. He's currently chief scientific advisor for the Department of Health and Social Care. He is also the professor of public and international health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's a practicing NHS consultant physician in acute medicine and infectious diseases at University College London Hospitals. Uh, and uh, he is also Gresham professor of physic uh, and uh, he will replace Dame Sally Davies uh, in October. So that's all good stuff. I have asked, but haven't had a response yet, uh, uh, what his view is of baby wipes and Novichok. Uh, we wait to see. But in the meantime, uh, Vladimir Putin has decided to make a comment on, uh, on this whole business. Uh, and he's basically just saying to the British government, will you wise up? Uh, he said, interests in economic and social spheres and global security are more important than spy games. London should leave all that trivia aside and do business. Yeah, but that unfortunately, I don't think they're going to. I think they're heavily committed to the spy business, uh, Mike, but we'll see. Absolutely. Now, even better news, uh, Greta Thunberg has, uh, has managed to uh, get herself uh, a badge. Uh, this is good news. Uh, this is Amnesty International has given Greta uh, and her Fridays for Future Global Movement uh, the um, uh, Amnesty International Ambassador of Conscience Award. Uh, so this uh, puts her in the same league as Nelson Mandela uh, and I'm sure she's uh, really delighted about that. Perhaps uh, people would want to uh, get in touch with Amnesty and, and let them know what they think. Nobody ever gives us any awards, Mike. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, there we are. Uh, well, we'd like to end with a UK column exclusive. Um, we are able to do this from time to time and we wanted to share this one with you. We were able to catch a glimpse, a rare glimpse of the mating ritual of Trump May parakeets. And uh, I hope you enjoy this one. I just found it fascinating. Let's just uh, play a little bit for you and uh, see where we go. Uh, what are we watching? We're just watching the behavior of the two parakeets. Uh huh. It's all right. We're just. If you've seen a mating ritual with uh, birds, it usually involves a lot of looking at each other and nodding <laughs> heads up and down. So I, I watched this clip several times and the conclusion I came to was that it was some form of mating ritual. But uh, we'll have to wait for further reports on that. Right. OK. OK. We'll end on that note today. We'll be back at the same time on Monday. Bye -bye. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye.